Good morning. How are you? I'd like to, um, as a prelude today, I'd like to begin with a, a clip from a, a 1976 film called Network. I don't have to tell you things are bad. Everybody knows things are bad. It's a depression. Everybody's out of work or scared of losing their job. The dollar buys a nickel's worth. Banks are going bust. Shopkeepers keep a gun under the counter. Punks are running wild in the street. And there's nobody anywhere who seems to know what to do, and there's no end to it. We know the air is unfit to breathe, and our food is unfit to eat. We sit watching our TVs while some local newscaster tells us that today we had 15 homicides and 63 violent crimes, as if that's the way it's supposed to be. We know things are bad, worse than bad. They're crazy. It's like everything everywhere is going crazy, so we don't go out anymore. We sit in the house, and slowly the world we're living in is getting smaller, and all we say is, please, at least leave us alone in our living rooms. Let me have my toaster and my TV and my steel-belted radios, and I won't say anything. Just leave us alone. Well, I'm not going to leave you alone. I want you to get mad. I don't want you to protest. I don't want you to write. I don't want you to write to your congressman because I wouldn't know what to tell you to write. I don't know what to do about the depression and the inflation and the Russians and the crime in the street. All I know is that first, you've got to get mad. You've got to say, I'm a human being. God damn it. My life has value. So, I want you to get up now. I want all of you to get up out of your chairs. I want you to get up right now and go to the window, open it, and stick your head out and yell, I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore. Is that great or, is that great or what? 1976. It could have been yesterday, right? I'm concerned about the GIS profession. Is there one? How can you tell if someone who calls himself a GIS professional, or a GIS educator for that matter, knows what she's doing? Believe it or not, this is a contentious question. Some of you know that it is. It's contentious because the demand for GIS work has surpassed the demand for other kinds of geospatial work despite the fact that GIS is a relatively young branch of the field. The rightful roles and qualifications of GIS professionals are in dispute. And there's competition for who gets to decide. By GIS professional, I mean someone who makes a living through learned professional work that requires advanced knowledge of geographic information systems technology, data, and methods. If that's what you do, or if that's something that you aspire to do, or that you hope that your child will have a future doing, then you have a stake in this debate. I became interested in the professionalization of GIS work in the 1990s when Bill Huxhold uh, raised these contentious questions. In the 1990s, well, Bill Huxhold looks, uh, might look a little bit like Mr. Clean, but um, unlike that cheerful ally of housekeepers everywhere, Bill was mad as hell in the 1990s, and he wasn't going to take it anymore. He was mad about the fact that it seemed that anyone could pass themselves off as a GIS professional, and there was no way to demonstrate whether they were competent or not. And that led to a movement in our field toward professional certification. Bill was mad as hell that anyone could pass herself off as knowing what to teach GIS students. And he called for the accreditation of higher education programs related to GIS. Now at the time, in the 1990s, I was an educator at Penn State University. And like most educators, I was quite skeptical about the effectiveness of certification or accreditation to um, assure quality in GIS practice or in education. However, the more I thought about uh, Bill's quest contentious questions, the more it occurred to me that what really was at stake was the ability of my students 
and some of yours to stand shoulder to shoulder with other professionals in the geospatial field. And that's when I got uh, active in Bill's movement. Remember when geospatial was uh, anointed as a high growth technology field by the Department of Labor about 2003? Those were heady times. But in the very next breath, they pointed out that a real weakness of our field was the lack of a coherent definition and a shortage of public awareness. Now, nobody likes a definition. As the philosopher Michael Davis has said, just like nobody likes a wise guy. However, to define something is, in a sense, to create it. And I believe that these early uh, folks like Bill Huxhol, Nancy Obermeyer, and others, by helping to define the field, have in fact helped create the thriving profession that many of us in this room, I believe, are part of. Here's some statistics about the geospatial workforce. Maybe you've seen these. These come from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, recently updated in 2011. Now, these numbers show, in one column, you see estimated employment for 10 occupations recognized by the Department of Labor. And the ones with asterisks beside them are occupations that were very recently created, just in December 2009. And for the first time in 2009, believe it or not, there were occupations recognized by the Department of Labor and now tracked by the Bureau of Labor Statistics that have GIS in the title. The, you'll notice that the estimated employment, some of those numbers are duplicative. John Johnson uh, pointed this out uh, earlier. There's 210,000 estimated GI, uh, GI scientists and technologists in 2010, and also the same number for GI, uh, geographic information systems technicians. That's because those estimates are drawn from the same pool. So those numbers don't add up exactly, but even when you eliminate duplication, you come up with nearly 425,000 geospatial professionals, about half of whom are GIS professionals. We only had anecdotal data about this in the past. These are educated guesses to be sure. The Bureau of Labor Statistics will need some years to actually track and count uh, professionals in the field. But this is more than anecdotal evidence for sure. And one thing we all ought to be excited about, especially those of us who teach and who advise students about careers in this field, that nearly 150,000 addition geospatial professionals will be needed in the next 10 years, according to Department of Labor estimates. And, and the largest share of those new jobs will be GIS jobs. There's a lot of talk at this conference about the geospatial technology competency model. This is uh, a Department of Labor activity sponsored by the Geotech Center that helped to bring into focus the competencies required for success in the geospatial field as a whole. Now, this graphic is just a metaphor for a, uh, a list of competencies, but if you have a look at that list, and it's very easily, uh, it's an open document, very easy to find, you'll see that at the bottom of that pyramid um, are foundational competencies that are really required for success in most fields. Some of them are specific to geospatial. For example, notice that geography is among the academic uh, competencies. Above the foundational competencies, you see that there are geospatial specific competencies. Industry-wide technical competencies are the core geospatial abilities and knowledge that the Department of Labor's panel felt applied across all of the uh, various occupations and industry sectors. And above that, this, the group that created this document recognized three industry sectors, positioning and data acquisition, analysis and modeling, software and application development. And those are conceived as clusters of competencies shared by workers in the field. Above that, then, are occupation-specific requirements. And if you visit the Department of Labor, you can get specific requirements for each of those 10 occupations that I pointed out. And John Johnson and the Geotech Center are performing uh, DACOM job analyses to be able to validate and refine those occupation descriptions. And the project that Danielle mentioned, the geospatial management competency model, corresponds to the upper left tier of this. It's a subset of the, of the GTCM. So our field has really come into focus in recent years. The this diagram 
has, th uh, th you'll note three uh, columns. The three columns correspond to the three sectors, the three industry sectors that I pointed out before. Positioning and data acquisition, analysis and modeling, software and application development. And under those columns, cutting across those columns, are the span of responsibilities and activities of three professions, not all, but three select professions within the geospatial field. Notice that professional surveyors, the bulk of activities for professional surveyors in this depiction um, are, fall under the positioning and data acquisition column. But they're not limited to that, of course. There's plenty of activities going on in analysis and modeling, and even in some cases, software and application development. My colleagues who are the core developers at Esri, those professionals are working primarily in software and application development, but they're also, some of them, involved in analysis and modeling tasks and even uh, positioning and data acquisition tasks as well. But GIS professionals fall in the middle. And notice that GIS professionals' activities and responsibilities span all three of those uh, sectors. However, the center of mass of, of GIS activity is in analysis and modeling. GIS professionals do a lot of things, and their activities overlap those of other professionals. But the core activity is using specialized GIS software to render actionable information from geospatial data. And the reason that there is a, a conflict and dispute among the professions in the geospatial world is that their activities overlap. It's also because of the fact that GIS professionals, though it is the largest geospatial profession now, is also the newest. And so um, there's, um, needless to say, there's competition for all of the new work that uh, GIS professionals um, are seeking. Despite all that, there's still a, a debate about whether GIS really constitutes a profession, whether it's just a tool, whether it's an occupation, or whether it in fact uh, is a learned profession. And here we're gonna use the Department of Labor's uh, own definition of a learned profession. One uh, characteristic of a learned profession is that it requires advanced knowledge and judgment. Now, the knowledge base of the GIS specialization within the geospatial field is by now very well defined. There's been a body of knowledge since 2006. The GTCM emerged at the Department of Labor in 2010, and John Johnson uh, continues to do uh, DACOM job analyses to identify the uh, duties and tasks that uh, GIS and remote sensing technicians are responsible for. So clearly, the advanced knowledge required uh, for GIS professionals is well-defined and distinctive. Another characteristic of learned profession is that there is specialized advanced education. And we've all seen the rise in recent years of practice-oriented professional degree programs at many institutions, all of which, all of whom are, are thriving. And it just so happens that all of the professional programs uh, that I'm listing here, these are master's and bachelor's degree programs in GIS and related fields, all the ones I ha show here happen to be distance education programs, which is the, the real growth area in uh, specialized professional education in GIS. But again, there's no question about the um, availability and the popularity of practice-oriented advanced education in GIS. Another characteristic of a learned profession, something that distinguishes it from a mere occupation, is a distinctive set of professional ethics. And Will Craig, um, working with ERISA through the 1990s, developed a code, the GIS Code of Ethics and the GIS Rules of, of Conduct. And if you study those, you'll notice distinctive, uh, distinctive ethical problems that arise in this field. For example, um, some of you may have heard on NPR a couple of years back um, a story about the uh, city, of, uh, the police department of Los Angeles seeking to create a map of Muslim neighborhoods in, um, in Los Angeles. Similar thing happened in New York in, uh, more, more recently. And the American Civil Liberties Union objected to this because they considered this 
this mapping activity to be geographic profiling. And in fact, the, the uproar uh, caused a halt to the, to the project. Well, I don't know about you, but it really struck me when mapping was equated with profiling. But that's just one of the distinctive ethical implications that uh, are associated with the practice of GIS. And it's also true that when a field comes to terms with its ethical challenges, that's another sign that the field itself is coming of age. Specialized credentials is another uh, hallmark of a profession. And there are several certification programs in GIS today. The one that has attracted uh, the most professionals is the GIS professional certification by the GIS Certification Institute, which has now 5,000 professionals uh, around the country and around the world. This is still a voluntary certification Portfolio-based certification still, although an examination process is in the works. The portfolio uh, looks for uh, levels, uh, thresholds of education, experience, and contributions to the profession. It's still voluntary, but it's not, like, not likely to be voluntary for long. As, as my friend Max Baber can uh, discuss with you this week, the, um, the Undersecretary for Defense Intelligence, did I get that right, Max? has mandated that there will be a mandatory uh, certification program for GIS analysts to begin with in the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, and this will begin spinning up this fall, right? And Max will be responsible for this in part. Mandatory certification uh, for professionals in that realm will certainly have an impact on the field as a whole over time. And so it's clear that this kind of specialized credentialing is really taking root in the GIS profession. So GIS has all the trappings of a learned profession, except one, perhaps. When you read uh, commentators who speak about professions, they talk about characteristic of a, a social ideal, sometimes called a moral ideal. That is, a vision for how the profession will make the world better. My boss, Jack Dangerman, is famous uh, every year for, for uh, exhorting his colleagues at the user conference that we be driven by a cause bigger than ourselves. But who has articulated a moral ideal for our field? Do you have one for yourself? This is the final step in having a profession. Uh, um, imagine in medicine, you can think of a, sh a shared moral ideal for medicine, it's to promote health. What's the moral ideal in law? It's to promote justice. So what is it for our field? Do we have one? Are we really a profession? Well, just for starters, and this is about conversation this week, uh, I'd, like to, uh, I'd like to lay one out for you and we can discuss how it works. I'd say that the GIS profession's moral ideal is to apply geospatial technologies and spatial thinking to design sustainable futures for people and places everywhere. Now, there are challenges confronting the GIS profession. In part, it has to do with the fact that the GIS profession is relatively young compared to other geospatial professions. Our, our leading certification program is, for the moment, voluntary and portfolio-based and viewed by some as weak. Educational programs that educate future geospatial professionals are not accredited. They're not accountable, including my own at Penn State. And there are efforts underway in the geospatial field to monopolize the practice of GIS through government regulation. And that's all about money. So in the face of these challenges, it's imperative to me, as an educator who, to whom uh, students have entrusted their future, their livelihoods, it's imperative to me that those of us who consider ourselves to be GIS professionals do what we can to strengthen our profession. And here I have seven suggestions. Seven things that you can do to strengthen the GIS profession. One, get certified. 
The fact that the existing certification program is imperfect is beside the point. Certification is a public commitment to competent and ethical practice and continuing professional development. And making that commitment is one of the best things you can do to strengthen the profession. Plan for lifelong learning. The geospatial technology competency model is a fabulous self-assessment tool by which you can determine your strengths and the gaps in your knowledge as a professional. And you can make plans to uh, fill those gaps with continuing education. Certification, for, for all its weaknesses, can be conceived as a roadmap to professional certification. Education, experience, contributions to the profession. That's a, those are good guidelines for how we can improve and continue to uh, develop professionally through our careers. Get involved. There are specialized organizations, not just ERISA, but I happen to be a board member, so. Uh, there are specialized organizations that uh, are devoted to continuing professional development and to advancing the interests of our profession. We should all be involved in one or more of these. And our employers, if they're smart, will support our efforts. If they're not smart, get involved anyway and find a better job. <laughs> know your profession. There is a lore and a history to our field. Some of you have helped to create that. We should all be able to describe to civilians what it is we do and where we came from. Our more than 40 year history now is something that we all should be able to describe, as well as our unique, the unique ethical implications that attend our work. We should work hard to have good, respectful working relations with other geospatial professionals. However, when our, profession is, when our profession's legitimacy is challenged, we should stand up for the GIS profession. Contributions to the profession under GISP certification means volunteering, among other things. Volunteering to uh, help out a teacher through the GEO Mentor Program, or volunteering to raise public awareness through GIS Day. There are plenty of opportunities for all of us to get involved in increasing public awareness of our profession. And finally, have a moral ideal. Be able to say what it is about this field that we're proud of. How is this field going to make the world better beyond our own interests? Why is GIS important to society and to the future? So I want you to stand up, get out of your chairs, stand up, and I want you to say, I'm a GIS professional and I'm not going to take it anymore. <laughs> I'm a GIS professional, and I'm not going to take it anymore. I'm a GIS professional, and I'm not going to take it anymore. Thank you very much.